you, you must stop Kyrian, or else something terrible will happen. I've been waiting for you, friends. To protect the life cycle. One of the best things about being a boy in the 90s, aside from watching the secret world of Alex Mack, was video game arcades. And any kid who would frequently visit arcades in the 90s is probably going to remember that very unique House of the Dead cabinet with that black curtain around it, designed to stop underage kids from seeing all the violence and gore. Except in reality, I think it had the opposite effect, it just made you even more interested in what was happening back there. Developed by Sega AM1, which was Sega's R&D department at the time, responsible for some of the most iconic arcade games of the 1990s, including the famous Virtua Cop series, along with the absolute classic Daytona USA. The thing is though, these were all pretty family friendly games. In Virtua Cop, even though you committed criminal genocide, it was still pretty tame when it came to the violence. Enemies would just spin around and fall to the ground when you shot them, visually none the worse for wear. Also, before we get too far into the review, I do need to stop and thank Raycon for sponsoring this video. Everyone's talking about these things and knows what they are at this point, but in case you don't, Raycon make really awesome earbuds that are about half the price of other wireless earbuds on the market. Skimping on the price, but not on the quality. I've had my pair for a few months now and I use them all the time when working out and editing videos. They're quick to pair to whatever device you're using and they have a really long battery life of over 6 hours. They even come in a handy case that can also charge them up to 4 times. The everyday E25 earbuds are the latest models and they're the best ones yet with seamless pairing, compact design and more bass which is something you can never get enough of. So if you want to get 15% off your first order you can click the link in the video description buyraycon.com backslash gman. And thanks again to these guys for sponsoring this video. Sponsors help me keep the channel alive and it's much appreciated. House of the Dead, on the other hand, was a little bit different and it was the first light gun shooter I can really remember playing that had actual blood in it, which was the reason it garnered a lot of controversy. There was five games in the main series, all released for the arcades, with the most recent one being House of the Dead Scarlet Dawn in 2018. Most of these in one way or another found their way to multiple platforms, including Microsoft Windows, the Sega Saturn, Sega Dreamcast, Nintendo Wii, Xbox and the PlayStation 3. And it also spawned a horrible movie that came out in 2003, directed by Uwe Boll, which used random clips from the first game as scene transitions, and somehow managed to make a film about a bunch of vapid ravers being murdered by zombies uninteresting. Either way, the franchise has somehow managed to survive over all these years, and I'd argue as a series, it's almost a household name when it comes to gaming, along with things like Super Mario Bros., Legend of Zelda, and Honey Pop. I'm fully aware of what I'm doing. Can't you see? Now the first game in the series, simply called House of the Dead, is one that's also credited as revitalizing the zombie genre at the time, and this was released in 1996. Playing as either Thomas Rogan or his partner, simply named G, your two agents working for a government agency called AMS, and you're heading into the mansion of a mad scientist named Dr. Curian. As an on-rails light gun shooter, this thing was pretty standard when it came to the gameplay. You've got a gun with six bullets, you shoot at things before they can attack you, then shoot off the screen to reload. Along the way, you try to not get hit and lose all of your health points, and then take on a boss at the end of each level. Rinse and repeat until the whole thing ends. The way that House of the Dead was cool, though, was in the way that it also offered up multiple pathways through levels depending on your actions. You could also rescue scientists who were being attacked by zombies as long as you were quick enough. And that often even give you back a life point in some cases too, which is a bit of a bold move for a game literally designed to just take all your money. Thank you. Like a lot of other rail shooters in the 90s too, the gameplay is awesome. The gunplay is loud and impactful. You almost feel like you're going to have an epileptic seizure sometimes. And the zombie designs are creative and fun. What's really interesting too is that this game came out in the arcades around the same time as Resident Evil did on the PlayStation 1, and there's a lot of similarities between both games. For starters, it's the player against a bunch of different kind of zombies, and they both take place inside a mansion that's a front for shady experiments. In both games, you eventually end up inside some kind of secret underground lab for the game's finale and have to take on some kind of advanced creature for the final boss. 
In Resident Evil, it was the tyrant. In House of the Dead, it's the magician. I shall destroy everything. House of the Dead, however, is way more action-packed and violent. For the time, the gore in this thing was just awesome, and to a lot of people, mostly baby boomers, it was even viewed as being gratuitous and offensive, but as a little kid, that just made it even more appealing. You could shoot zombies and take massive chunks out of their torso or head, even blowing their head completely off. Like I said before, compare that to something like Virtua Cop, where when you shoot someone, there was just a flash of light, and then they fell to the ground. Aside from being released in arcades, this was also released on the Sega Saturn and the PC in 1998. The thing is though, both of these ports are pretty piss weak, especially the PC version, which was about as half-assed as a port could get. Running at a whopping 640x480 resolution, the port does have a couple of unique features though. Like being able to choose to play as different characters with different hit points, weapon damage, and all that kind of stuff. Aside from that, you can also choose how many credits you get, how many life points, the blood color, and even if the game has auto reloading, saving you from having to mash the right mouse button every time you have to reload. Other than that though, it's a pretty crappy port. It looks like complete rubbish compared to the arcade version. And unless you've still got the CD, you can't even get any music playing during the levels, which was one of the best aspects of the arcade's cheesy tone. Either way though, each version is pretty much identical in how it plays out. The game starts off outside the house, even though it's a bit of a misnomer given its size. And you go right into shooting zombies and saving these poor scientists from getting killed. You're attacked by these weird gargoyle dog things that I don't think ever show up for the rest of the entire game. Before your girlfriend and everyone's gal pal Sophie is kidnapped by a flying creature that will take on later in the game's level. Sophie! Eventually you end up moving inside the house, taking on some weird zombie monkeys, being able to choose from two different routes moving ahead too. You get these cool sequences like a zombie smashing down a door and some of these monkeys jumping through some stained glass windows before another chance to rescue some more scientists. Thank, Thank you. you! After that you're in some kind of courtyard and you see how this game really starts to hold nothing back, throwing heaps of enemies at you. This I think was a real hallmark of this game's design in the arcades and that it didn't mess around in trying to take all of your pocket change. Eventually you catch up to Sophie before she's absolutely pimp slapped by the first boss. Smack your ears, bitch. Named the Chariot, who turns out to be really easy. Aside from being named after tarot cards, every boss in the game has some kind of weak spot that you need to target to actually damage them. This guy's weak spot is on his chest, and after hitting him enough times, his armor falls off and you can even start shooting the flesh off his bones. Awesome. <laughs> After he's finished off, Sophie then dies from her wounds because apparently that was a hell of a slap. Sophie! The second level takes place in a few different locations and it dials shit up a few notches. You've got assholes throwing barrels at you along with what I can only describe as Freddy Krueger zombies. Mini zombies with fedoras and claws for hands. All they're really missing is that ugly sweater and some bad puns. Stop the prime time, bitch! <laughs> They wear fedoras though, which probably means they're atheists and that they condone pirating video games, so gun them down as soon as possible. This level is great though, you've got zombies dropping at you from the ceilings, there's zombies hiding behind bookshelves, zombie slugs, zombie bats and plenty of bumbling scientists to rescue. There's even zombies with mallets, chainsaws and fleshlights. Even test tube zombies jumping out and smashing out of incubation tanks. The boss for this level is that little shithead you see in the opening of the game that was kidnapping Sophie and its weak spot is its entire body. Starts off by just hovering in the air and getting some bats to attack you and the irony of that attack given what's happening in 2020 is not lost on me. Then it starts flying all over the place at which point you see that familiar arcade style boss design rearing its ugly head. Where it pulls off some rubbish attacks where you've got literally frames to hit it before it deals damage. For the third level, we're moving through some underground lab looking areas. There's cyborg zombies that shoot spikes at you and bigger, tougher armored zombies with metallic arms, along with little spiders. And you can really see the difference in this level between the PC port and the arcade version. I mean, the PC port lacks any kind of lighting or atmosphere. It's just completely dull and flat. On the arcade version though, this level is dark and really creepy. At the end of this level, we finally get to meet the big bad guy, Curian, before taking on another boss that almost feels out of place given the game's setting. The only way I can think to describe this thing is that it's some kind of giant robotic zombie spider. Now, it looks menacing, but it's actually pretty easy. 
Its weak spot is its head, but about all it does is move slowly towards you while shooting spunk out of its ass. It's a pretty lame fight, though and about as easy as the first boss, though the little area you fight it in is pretty interesting visually. It's kind of like you're fighting it inside an LSD tunnel. <laughs> For the eponymous final chapter, there's only a few more zombies to shoot through before a bit of a lame boss rush where you take on the first and second boss again. Again, reminding us how blatantly this game was designed to take our money. And then a better example of that is with the final boss, the Magician. Say hello to my masterpiece. It was named the Magician because of the way that it magically made all of your spare change disappear from your pockets when playing. Now this thing shows up and kills Kuren right off the bat because, yeah, fuck him. And then before you know it, you're going head to head with it. The Magician just kind of encapsulates everything I dislike about arcade game boss design because it's just designed to be a cheap asshole. It flies all over the screen, launching projectiles that I can barely shoot with a mouse. I mean, imagine trying to do it as a 12 year old kid with pizza grease and Cheeto dust all over your fingers. Anyway, once this thing is dead, the game's finished. And let's get an F in chat for the poor cleaner who has to go through the house later on and clean up all the zombie blood and guts. You haven't seen anything yet. All in all though, House of the Dead is still a pretty good arcade shooter. I never knew anyone who could beat this thing in a single credit back in the day. In fact, most people I know probably died on the first level but it's earned its reputation as a solid and violent game and everyone I know who played it just absolutely loved it. It's just a shame there's never really been any further support for this PC version. In 1998, it was followed up with the sequel, House of the Dead 2, which along with being released in arcades, also got a port to both the Dreamcast in 1999 and the PC in 2001. The Dreamcast port 2 was actually really good and I even had a mate in school who had a copy of the game which came with this very unique looking light gun. The PC port though again kind of suffered, mostly because it was just really lazily slapped together. I mean you can't even change the resolution in the settings for instance. But the core gameplay is still as solid as my bowel movements after a three course meal at a steakhouse. My god. This one takes place two years after the events of the first game and again like Resident Evil we can draw a pretty obvious comparison. I mean, like Resident Evil, the first game takes place in a mansion. The second game takes place in a more populated area. In Resident Evil, it was the Spencer Mansion and then Raccoon City. In House of the Dead 2, it was Curian's Mansion and now it's Venice, Italy. It's like poetry, rhymes. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. What I love most about this game though is the voice acting. Now this is some of the most horrendous voice acting, like, ever. Don't care who it is, no one's gonna get away with this. Let's hurry. James! Come quickly! Something terrible is happening! Thank you for rescuing me. I don't know if something was lost in translation or what the hell happened here, but some of the lines in this are just absolute gold and they don't make a lick of sense. Definitely adds to the game's charm and the inconsistency in dialogue from sentence to sentence and even word to word is just so entertaining. James, go and prevent the confusion in the city. The real highlight is the main villain, Goldman. I don't know who they hired to do the voice work here, but the guy almost deserves an award for how bad this is. People of the AMS, I am Goldman. I don't care if you people try to get in my way or not. In time, you'll find out who's right. Fuck the police coming straight from the underground. Goldman. In this game, you're playing as a new character, James Taylor, working alongside agents Amy Crystal and Harry Harris. Yeah, Harry Harris. What a name. It's like being called Joey Jones or Robbie Robinson. We also see G returning from the first game at the beginning for a brief period, but he looks like death warmed up. It's not the last we'll save him though, so don't worry. James, do this. Gameplay wise, this really is a step up from the first game, even if it does recycle a couple of bosses and enemies. Right off the bat, you'll notice the improved gore effects and even how zombies melt into their own bodily fluids when they die, which just looks awesome. Instead of rescuing scientists now, you're instead just rescuing civilians. There's the return of those little zombie slugs and new armored zombies who hop around like frogs. The action is just constant right off the bat and they really don't mess around and I think it makes it hands down one of the better games in the entire series. After shooting your way through the streets in the first level, the first boss is a giant headless suit of armor with an axe. And its weak spot is this little floating gargoyle named Zeal, which is pretty much just the same in concept as the Hanged Man from the first game, and it even sounds the same. In the second level, you're moving through narrow alleyways. There's zombies that throw axes. There's zombie owls, because that's a thing now. And even these cool looking zombies in executioner outfits. What's wrong with this city? 
At one point, there's a zombie armed with two goddamn chainsaws, one in each hand. I mean, I guess the only thing better than one chainsaw is two. The chaos of the city is increasing. The boss fight for this level is against this weird looking zombie fish man with a trident. <laughs> Next up, you're on the back of a speedboat, moving through the Venice canals as zombies drop off nearby bridges and owls come swooping down to attack you. And get a load of this idiot going for a swim during a zombie epidemic, and this guy taking his boat out for a spin. Thanks for saving me. Eventually, you'll move into this underground passage for the boss fight, which is basically just a five-headed hydra, though only one head can attack at a time, making it pretty easy to predict. This thing also has the same sound effect as the Battle Lord from Duke Nukem 3D. <laughs> What is it? Once you've killed four of the heads, the fifth head then takes off and starts swimming around this submerged area, but it's pretty easy to take out. James then shows what could only be described as giving zero fucks when he finds out his friends are being attacked. Amy? What happened, Amy? For the fourth level, you've now got a flashlight attached to your crosshair, which is kind of cool, and you're still underground, shooting bats and even zombies with armored faceplates. And check out this guy too with a goddamn broadsword and chainmail armor. Again, I'm kind of wondering what all of these civilians are doing down here too. I mean, it seems like a dimly lit sunken passage is the last place to seek refuge. But then again, these are the same idiots who take their boat out for a drive in the middle of a zombie epidemic, so I'm not at all surprised. Up next, prepare for some of the greatest dialogue you're ever going to hear in any game, because Goldman is back and he outdoes himself, yet again. And I love how you can tell they've actually put Goldman's character model inside there, like it's not a projection, they've just literally put the model inside a giant box to make it look like it's on a screen. This is a present from me to you. It's like that scene in Flying High 2 with William Shatner. Why the hell aren't I notified about these things? What happens next though is the best boss fight in the entire game. You're being chased by this giant zombie with a chainsaw. It's kind of like Leatherface on steroids. He smashes through nearby walls. He jumps off ledges and changes his path to try to flank you. It's incredible. And check out the quads on this bad boy. Like you know this guy never skipped leg day. At this point, James has had enough of Goldman's crap and heads off to finally take him down. Goldman, I'm not gonna let you get away with this. <laughs> This final level, like the final level in the first game, again has some pretty lame boss rushes. But considering none of the bosses were all that tough though, it shouldn't be too much of an issue. In a pretty piss weak move though, they even bring back the magician from the first game, and again, this thing is a bit of a prick. You do get this pretty cool sequence though, where you're driving in a convertible and zombies are trying to jump on top of the car. But this last level is another great example of pocket change guzzling arcade design at its absolute finest. Only man himself can control its fate. You're nothing. For the final level, you're inside Goldman's corporate tower, taking on what can only be described as cyborg zombies, with laser swords for hands and zombies that cloak and throw knives at you. Some of them even materialize through walls, like simps materializing to defend their favorite cam girl. After another boss rush and a few more dozen dead zombies, you then finally head to head with Goldman himself. I've been waiting for you, friends. And he drops some final philosophical truth bombs. This is the final battle. The final boss finally reveals itself, sounding like Zordon from Power Rangers with some more hilariously bad dialogue. I am the one who rules over nature. I shall destroy and hate mankind. But despite the title of Emperor, this guy ain't too tough. First off, he launches a bunch of little metallic balls at you that kind of reminds me of the Silver Spheres from Phantasm. Once his health reaches a certain point, though, is when he starts spawning in one-off versions of the other bosses. And this is where it starts to get a bit annoying because you have to hit these things in a strict time limit to damage him. Soon enough, though, he dies, exploding and turning into a bad acid trip. <laughs> Then Goldman throws himself off the roof, a metaphor for that voice actor's career. Hashtag bring back Goldman. To protect the life cycle. All up though, I think this is an awesome sequel. It looks better, it sounds better, it's gorier, and it has way more enemy types. It does recycle a few bosses, which is kind of disappointing, but as a sequel, it's everything you'd want. It's finally over. After the release of this game, the series kind of went on hiatus for a bit, and it wasn't until 2002 when the third game was released in arcades, and even then it wasn't until 2005 when it got ported to the PC. Which yet again was a pretty lazy and sloppy port. 
though at least now you can actually choose a resolution and other options like anti-aliasing and texture quality. It also saw release on the Xbox, the Nintendo Wii and the PlayStation 3, with the PC version still getting the lowest reviews out of every version though, which really says a lot considering it should have been the best of the bunch. This takes place in the futuristic year of 2019, where G, returning from House of the Dead 2 and still somehow very much alive, teams up with Thomas's daughter Lisa to rescue him from one of Dr. Curian's old research facilities. Let's go, G. The story is actually pretty cool in this one too, in the way that it explores a bit more of the backstory into why the events of the first game took place, if you actually care about that crap. Turns out that Dr. Curian was just trying to make some kind of a cure for his son Daniel, who was sick at the time. Daniel listened to Limp Biscuit. he smoked Winfield Reds, and he had one of those wallet chain things, so yeah, he was pretty sick. Somehow though that cure went awry and Curian ended up instead creating mutant monkeys, giant slugs, flesh eating bats and of course zombies that walk around and try to murder everyone. Yeah it's a simple mistake Curian, could have happened to anyone. These genes will change the future! The voice acting in this one though is at least better than the last game, though that's not really saying much. And there's a few short cinematics in each level too. But it's really just a means of explaining why you're moving from point A to point B. Instead of rescuing scientists or civilians, now you're instead just rescuing the second character from being attacked. Lisa, back me up! What's really the biggest difference though is that now instead of pistols, you've got shotguns. Which even shows up on screen like a traditional first person shooter when you're firing, and it reloads automatically when empty. It's mostly just for show though, because it doesn't really do any more damage than the pistols. And it also takes half a second delay before it reloads, which doesn't sound like much, but can be the difference between taking a hit or avoiding one, which can be annoying. The game's also got four separate endings, depending on the path you take throughout the game. See, at the end of each level, you hop in an elevator and then can choose where to go next, with each area changing depending on the order you choose. I'm sorry, I should have reacted faster back there. My main issue with this one is the boss fights. One of them is against a giant zombie security guard, which is then recycled and used again in a later level, which is just lazy. One of them's against what's basically a giant zombie sloth, and this one kind of sucks too. It runs up the walls of this giant cage, and you've got to shoot its targeted weak spot before it can attack. Another one is against a giant mutated plant, which may as well just be Plant 43 from Resident Evil. And the final boss is the usual smorgasbord of bullshit attack patterns, with tiny windows of time given to the player to inflict damage. It's supposed to be a mutated clone of Dr. Curian that flies all over the place in a way that's probably going to make most people vomit. But I will give them points though for how cool it looks visually. Oh man! Still, you can't fault the shooting aspect and it's still pretty fun shooting holes out of all the various zombie types you come up against. Zombies with a machete and buzzsaw? Check. And get a load of these ones too, they look like Guile from Street Fighter. <laughs> A lot of the time too, the zombies are going to keep coming, even after you've shot off their legs or even their head. And it's pretty radical seeing a headless, armless zombie coming at you. It's kind of like the undead equivalent of the Black Knight from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. One of the best things about all of these games has always been the blood and gore, and that's still the case with this third game. So overall, this thing's okay. If you're expecting any kind of massive difference from the rest of the series though, well, this ain't it. And I think if you bought this at full price back in the day, you'd be justified for being pissed off, considering like the other games, it really only lasts for 30 or 40 minutes. I never was any good at gardening. Finally, we're on to House of the Dead 4, which is the final game out of the original arcade series that's playable on another platform. And the only way to get your hands on this thing is through the PlayStation Store for the PlayStation 3. There's probably a reason for that, and that's because this game really ain't all that good. In fact, I think it's the worst game in the main series. At least, that's my thoughts on it anyway. It's got some of the lamest boss fights too. Two of them just being straight up recycled from House of the Dead 1 and 2. In fact, speaking of the second game, the last two levels in this one are just the final two levels of that game reused. On the plus side, it does have the return of Goldman, who's back again, babbling about philosophical mumbo-jumbo and sitting in his large, empty office. 
but this time they hired a voice actor who actually knows what he's doing, so all the novelty and amusement from the train wreck of that other guy is just lost. Hashtag bring back Goldman. To protect the life cycle. Playing this with a PlayStation Move controller though is genuinely fun, and way better than trying to use a controller which is like trying to fence with a tennis racket. The plot for this one's all out of order too. It takes place after the events of House of the Dead 2, but before House of the Dead 3. These timelines are so confusing. James is back yet again working with rookie agent Kate Green, who's wearing the kind of outfit that somehow makes her look fashionable, but also functional. I don't know how that red jacket would go though. I kind of imagine it'd be like a red rag to a ball to the zombies. Anyway, these two are in Italy in the AMS headquarters before they're trapped inside during an earthquake. A couple of days later they finally get out, but then find the city under attack by zombies, with old mate Goldman behind the whole thing. This is exactly how it happened three years ago. The battle is starting again. Instead of a pistol or a shotgun, this time you've got a submachine gun, and you reload this thing by shaking the move controller really quickly, simulating, I guess, the motion of throwing in a new magazine. Just like the third game, when you reload, the weapon shows up briefly on the screen too, which I'm a big fan of. When something grabs onto you, you've also got to shake the remote to get free, and often you'll get knocked on your ass and have to quickly shoot nearby zombies before you can get back to your feet. As well as that, you've got three grenades, which you can throw out, killing a bunch of zombies at once, which is always really useful. We'll try to make our way through. <laughs> It also allows you to choose which way you want to head at key moments, with each route playing out a lot differently. We have to take a path. Other than that though, it's pretty standard stuff and kind of boring to be honest. The first level starts off as you're escaping the AMS headquarters, shooting zombies in lab coats and shirtless zombies with waxed hair and crocodile skin pants. No, seriously. After shooting your way through a few waves of these guys, it's onto the first boss named Justice, which is pretty much just the same as the chainsaw zombie from the second game. In the way that it chases after you throughout this mini arena, only this time it's lacking an actual chainsaw. And you know what? This is really part of what pisses me off about this game, is how you've got to target these weak points and deal out enough damage in a very strict time limit before the boss can attack you. It's the same as it was in House of the Dead 3, but now that window is way smaller, and it pisses me off. In the next level, you're in the sewers, fighting these things that look like what would happen if Chewbacca and the Tar Man had a baby. Then there's these guys who throw barrels at you. Like, where have I seen that before? Later in this level, there's also zombies that walk around with propane tanks that kind of remind me of Isaac from Dead Space. The boss for this level is also kind of recycled. Now this thing is called the Lovers. It's a big spider with a little spider on its head. Again, you've got to shoot the weak spot in a short amount of time, which is the smaller spider, or else it's able to get off one of its attacks and take away one of your much coveted health points. Once you kill this thing, it falls down the elevator shaft and disappears along with my patience. The third level takes place in a subway, and this one starts off pretty good. There's always something about subway or train levels in these rail shooters that's always a whole lot of fun. Get out of our place! This subway level also brings back those axe-wielding zombies from the second game, along with these guys who I guess you could call hobo midget zombies. At one point you can even choose which side of the platform you want to head for. Eventually you hop on a train and then you're up against one of the most annoying bosses in the entire series, this weird looking bitch called the Empress. The tarot card for the Empress shows her holding a big scepter. I've got a big scepter for you right here, bitch. But the Empress in the game holds a huge ass chainsaw. I don't see the connection, but I think if we're going to start arguing about the meanings of things in this game, well, we'll all start losing our minds and bleeding from our assholes. Anyway, this thing is a real pain in the ass, and I've never once managed to avoid some of these attacks. If you manage to beat this thing without taking the hit, well, then you're a god among men. The fourth level is probably the shortest one in the entire game. You start off moving through a disused department store before you're on the street shooting gargoyles and zombies in ties and business shirts. The boss for this fight one is a little bit different. This thing is a huge, fat, bloated piece of shit called Temperance. This guy's also somehow got tribal tattoos as well as fingerless gloves and leather jeans. You can't actually damage this guy though, instead what you've got to do is hold him off until you reach a nearby tower, where you can knock off a large clock which hits him on the head and kills him instantly, leaving him also wide open for some trash talking from James. Temper this, buddy. Damn, son. Then the final two levels are pretty much the same last couple of levels from House of the Dead 2. Oh, that's for the second last one, you hop into a car, then start driving towards Goldman's building, dealing with these M. Bison looking zombies who can pick up the side of the car. 
And these zombies who zip all over the place like the agents from the Matrix. A couple of times, one of them even jumps on the hood of the car like that bit from the highway chase in the Matrix Reloaded. Have to admit though that watching a bandana wearing zombie try to sideswipe me is hilarious. The boss for this stage is an edgelord named the Star who hovers around like the magician and launches out slow moving projectiles. His weak spot is a gaping hole in his chest, so you just pump that thing with bullets until he finally goes down. Looks like you're the one who failed the test. Good luck trying to dodge some of his attacks though, like this bit here when he turns into a fucking windmill, I have no idea how you're supposed to hit him. Finally though, we're in Goldman's building, making a beeline to his office. Again dealing with cyborg zombies with laser swords, zombies that look like a combination of the Silver Surfer and Iron Man, and then you've got these guys that look like Freezer from Dragon Ball Z and throw laser sticks at you. I hate these things the most in the entire game, in fact I think the entire series. And whoever designed these things should take a long walk off a short pier into an ocean filled with piranhas infected with AIDS. They saved the absolute worst fight for last though. The final boss named The World is a big moth looking thing with a blatant weak spot on its chest that has two annoying forms. The first one ain't too bad, it either spawns in this ice axe that you've got to shoot and shatter before it can attack you. And the other one it launches out some ice crystals that snap you in place and you've got to shake the controller to get free. His second form though is just utter bullshit. Now he's launching out Chinese New Year dragons or something that spiral in towards you. And he's got three different ways in which he can attack you with these things, pretty much all of which I could barely even avoid. I mean, at this point you know that they really just stopped caring about whether or not these fights were balanced and they just came up with whatever they wanted to. When you're playing on the PlayStation 3, the consolation is that you've got more continues than you know what to do with, but I can't even imagine trying to beat this thing at the arcade. I think it'd be easier to piss into a shot glass from the other side of a room than it would be to beat this without dying. Anyway, after you manage to beat this second form, the stupid thing evolves yet again, and James, like an absolute, Chad sacrifices himself to kill it by blowing up. James! Then you get an ending depending on how well you played, with there being three different ones in total. Yeah, and I meant to say before how I love the way the game subtly chastises you for your crappy performance at the end of each level. What's wrong? You're not feeling well? After having finished this game a bunch of times, I can see why Sega never made a physical copy. Probably would have cost more money to burn all the discs and make all the cases and spend money on shipping than it would have earned from sales. And if I had to rate all of the games in terms of personal preference, without a doubt, this one would be at the bottom. And I think House of the Dead 2 at the top. There's just so much to love about how cheesy and campy that game is and the voice acting just really adds to the charm. This is a present from me to you. And that about wraps up the entire main series of games. The only one I'm missing is Scarlet Dawn, but that's still only in the arcades and hasn't had any kind of port to another platform, so it's kind of hard to talk about it. Now, I'm aware that I'm missing some of the spin-off titles like The Typing of the Dead as well as House of the Dead Overkill, but I'll probably do a video on House of the Dead Overkill in the future because there's a whole heap to talk about there alone and it wasn't even developed by Sega AM1. There was also a bunch of different times a lot of these games got ported to other platforms. Now, like I said, I know that House of the Dead 2 and 3 are playable on the Nintendo Wii. House of the Dead 3 was also on the Xbox and the PlayStation 3, but those ports don't really change the core of the gameplay all that much, so I don't see any real point in talking about them over the PC versions. As a series though, House of the Dead is still highly enjoyable. That simple premise of shooting things in the head over and over and seeing lots of blood and guts is a formula that just never seems to dwindle. Along with Resident Evil, I think we owe its existence to the revival of the zombie genre. Without it, we probably wouldn't have awesome films like 28 Days Later or the Dawn of the Dead remake. Or be able to watch the Walking Dead TV series slowly decline into the absolute shit show it's now become. Where I honestly think that watching shit stains on the side of my toilet bowl crust up is time more well spent. So tip your hat, raise a glass or bow your head in silence for one of the most important video game series of all times. If not for that though, then at least as a token of respect for our fallen comrade. Hashtag bring back Goldman. Thanks for watching. Farewell friends. Farewell.